Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and I'm back today with my 11th conversation with you about Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Now, if you have watched my 10th lecture or all the other ones, um, you know that we had reached a point in our reading where Freire is trying to discuss the internal violence amongst the oppressed. Why do they turn on each other or are oppressive to each other? Why do the instances of domestic violence increase in colonized situations? And that is where he starts on page 62, and uh, he starts explaining that, right? Uh, it's still based in his clear understanding of the construction of the native self, of peasants' identity and other oppressed groups within the logical system of oppression created by the oppressors, right? And what's interesting to note is that he starts this discussion with the work of Fanon. And so uh, the first quote that I'll read to you from the book is actually a direct quotation from The Wretched of the Earth. Uh, so we'll go to my reading of page 62 and 63, middle of 63, and then I'll come back and talk about it a little more. So here we go. The colonized man will first manifest this aggressiveness which has been deposited in his bones against his own people. This is the period when the Negroes beat each other up and the policies Police and magistrates do not know which way to turn when faced with the astonishing waves of crime in North Africa. While the settler or the policeman has the right, the livelong day to strike the native, to insult him and to make him crawl to them, you will see the native reaching for his knife at the slightest hostile or aggressive glance caused on him by another native. For the last resort of the native is to defend his personality vis-a-vis -vis his brother. It is possible that in this behavior they are once more manifesting their duality because the oppressor exists within their oppressed comrades. When they attack those comrades, they are indirectly attacking the oppressor as well. On the other hand, at a certain point in their existential experience, the oppressed feel an irresistible attraction towards the oppressors and their way of life. Sharing this way of life becomes an overpowering aspiration. In their alienation, the oppressed want at any cost to resemble the oppressors, to imitate them, to follow them. This phenomena is especially prevalent in the middle class oppressed, who yearn to be equal to the eminent men and women of upper class. Albert Memmi, in an exceptional analysis of the colonized mentality, it refers to the contempt he felt towards the colonizer mixed with passionate attraction towards him. How could the colonizer look after his workers while periodically gunning down a crowd of colonized? How could the colonized deny himself so cruelly yet make such excessive demands? Self-deception is an, uh, sorry. How could he hate the colonizers and yet admire them so passionately? I too felt this admiration in spite of myself. That's Albert Memmi. Self-depreciation is another characteristic of the oppressed which derives from their internalization of the opinion the oppressors hold of them. So often do they hear that they are good for nothing, know nothing, and are incapable of learning anything, that they are sick, lazy, and unproductive, that in the end they become convinced of their own unfitness. The peasant feels inferior to the boss because the boss seems to be the only one who knows things and is able to run things. They call themselves ignorant and say the professor is the one who has knowledge and to whom they should listen. The criteria of knowledge imposed upon them are the conventional ones. Why don't you, said a peasant, peasant participating in a culture circle, circle, explain the pictures first. That will, it will take less time and won't give us a headache. Almost never do they realize that they too know things 
they have learned in their relations with the world and with other women and men. Given the circumstances which have produced their duality, it is only natural that they distrust themselves. Not infrequently, peasants in educational projects begin to discuss a generative theme in a lively manner, then stop suddenly and say to the edu educator, excuse us, we are, ought to keep quiet and let you talk. You're the one who knows. We don't know anything. They often insist that there is no difference between them and the animals. When they do admit of difference, it favors the animals. They are freer than we are. So as you can see in this reading, right, part of it is uh, Freire is pretty consistent, right? What he's trying to uh, explain to us through Fanon and through Albert Mimi, right, two people who had studied not simply uh, the colonial world, but also how does it create human subjectivities. Fanon from his psychoanalytical angle in Algeria and Albert Mimi also in Algeria but from his own experience of being someone in the middle because he was not Arab, he was Jewish, right? And as we read, the question is, you know, why do the natives turn against each other? Why does it become a point of pride for them to defend themselves, their honor, right? And obviously what Freire is hinting at and is, is wants us to understand is that the part of that psyche, as Fanon taught us, is developed within a very violent system in which there is a hierarchy. What is the hierarchy? That the public sphere is foreclosed to native men. They absolutely feel emasculated in it, right? So where do they turn then to express their manliness? Since the colonizer is all powerful and they've internalized it, right? They turn on each other. So the development of local gangs, crime gangs, being aggressive to fellow Arabs or fellow natives, that becomes the circle of their violence, right? Their aggressiveness, and that becomes the destructive mode of masculinity that they adopt. Even worst case, especially for peasants and others who absolutely feel powerful, powerless in the outside world, is that they, since they have internalized this duality that a relationship can only be of dominance and, and the oppressed, they then perpetuate that system within their family structures, against their children, against their uh, spouses and all. So what Memi, Fanon, and Freire are then teaching us is not just to individualize these actions and certainly not essentialize it as the colonizers did, right? Algerians and Arabs are violent, right? Uh, but to give an account of how does that subjectivity emerge. And what Freire is also saying is that it's not just that the natives and the peasants turn on each other, it's also that they have no faith in themselves. They have internalized this idea what the oppressors say about them, that they are lazy, they are stupid, they are uneducated, that even when you are working with them, right, they are looking for answers and they are very reluctant to think that they can think for themselves, right? And they would often use the vocabularies of describing themselves somewhere as dumb animals, right? And the last line in my reading was where they actually believe that animals are better than them because they are freer, right? So this self-deprecation, it's not just performative, it's deeply internalized, right? And how to, now remember, pedagogy of the oppressed is a pedagogy project. Right? It's a revolutionary pedagogy project which is not just trying to dispense knowledge to people who don't know things. It is trying to come up with a system of education that enables the practitioners of that education, the students, to learn themselves, but also in the process of learning that liberate themselves you know, from the monocles of the system in which their subjectivities were created, but also in the process liberate the oppressors themselves. So 
Um, and this meekness and submissiveness that the peasants and the students display, this deep respect for the teacher, this idea that teacher knows all things, right, is also part of that thing that's experience that they have internalized. More importantly, if you are from anywhere from the former colonies, think of it. Think of your students if you teach or when you were a student. How many times you sat in the class assuming that you are there to receive knowledge from the master, from the teacher? And, and, and very rarely would we dare to ask a question that challenged the authority of our teacher, even when sometimes they were wrong, right? And part of the reason was that we had internalized that hierarchy, that we are ignorant, we don't know anything, we're not participants in our own education, and what the teacher dispenses, we take it, and then we become knowledgeable. And that applies to the classroom situation, but the actual real-life situations as well, and that's where Freire is taking us. So I'll continue reading on the next page. Uh, I think I had stopped uh, uh, here. Um, you know, I had stopped in the middle of the page 63. I'll go to reading the next part and then come back to you in a few minutes after that. It is striking, however, to observe how this self-depreciation changes with the first changes in the situation of oppression. I heard a peasant leader say in a sentimiento meeting. They are respected as men. We are going to show everyone that we were never drunkards or lazy. We were exploited. As long as their ambiguity persists, the oppressed are reluctant to resist and totally lack confidence in themselves. They have a diffuse magical belief in the invulnerability and power of the oppressor. The magical force of the landowner's power holds particular sway in the rural areas. A sociological friend of mine, a sociologist friend of mine tells of a group of armed peasants in a Latin American country who recently took over a latifundium. For tactical re reasons, they planned to hold the landowner as a hostage, but not one peasant had the courage to guard him. His very presence was terrifying. It's also possible that the act of opposing the boss provoked guilt feelings. In truth, the boss was inside them. The oppressed must see examples of the vulnerability of the oppressor so that a contrary conviction can begin to grow within them. Until this occurs, they will continue disheartened, fearful and beaten. As long as the oppressed remain unaware of the causes of their condition, they fatalistically accept their exploitation. Further, they are apt to react in a passive and alienated manner when confronted with the necessity to struggle for their freedom and self-affirmation. Little by little, however, they tend to try out forms of rebellious action. In working towards liberation, one must neither lose sight of this passivity nor overlook the moment of awakening. With, within their unauthentic view of the world and of themselves, the oppressed feel like things owned by the oppressor. For the latter, to be is to have almost always at the expense of those who have nothing. For the oppressed, at a certain point in their existential experience, to be is not to resemble the oppressor, but to be under him, to depend on him. Accordingly, the oppressed are emotionally dependent. The peasant is dependent. He can't say what he wants. Before he discovers his dependence, he suffers. He lets off steam at home, where he shouts at his children, beats them, and despairs. He complains about his wife and thinks everything is dreadful. He doesn't let off steam with the boss because he thinks the boss is a superior being. Lots of times the peasant gives vent to his sorrows by drinking. This total emotional dependence can lead the oppressed to what Fromm calls necrophilic behavior, the destruction of life, their own or that of their oppressed fellows. 
It is only when the oppressed find the oppressor out and become involved in the organized struggle for their liberation that they begin to believe in themselves. This discovery cannot be purely intellectual but must involve action. Nor can it be limited to mere activism but must include serious reflection. Only then will it be a praxis. So this was my reading from top of page 64 to the middle of page 65. And there are two terms that were I used in the reading and one of them has a foot note on it and that is ascent temieto, right? Ascent temiento, right? And that, uh, the root note raise, uh, is refers to a production unit of the Chilean agra agrarian reform experiment, right? And, and that's a group in which that conversation happened. So latifundium that was used later on that reading is any large estate holding by a large landowner. It comes uh, from the Roman system, but still is practiced in so many parts of the world. Now, where we are headed in these passages that we just read, he's already given us an account of how the peasant, the oppressed, are caught within the logic of the power system created by the oppressor class. What we are also learning is that they are so incorporated in that system that they, in that duality, that they think themselves worthless, not capable of learning new things. And they have started believing in the labels that were assigned to them by the colonizers and by the oppressors, being lazy, being negligent, being ignorant, right? They refer to themselves as such. And coming out of it is not going to happen through a natural teleological process. The awakening must be initiated through collaboration with others. And that's where education comes in, right? And the main thing to learn then is, of course, for the oppressed to become aware of the conditions of their own existence, right? Remember, this was the biggest question in early Marxism as well. How would the workers know of their own exploitation, right? Because ideology was masking that. So hence, you know, Lukács' theory of disalienation, Marx's own idea of how to create disalienated labor, all of that is geared towards how to convince the oppressed class to learn of their own true value, to learn of the system within which they are caught, and then try to change it, right? But learning that we exist in that system, that the oppressed exist in that system, is the key. That's the first point. And that happens in an encounter, in a study circle, or elsewhere for Freire, in a conversation, right, with the peasants where that light goes on where they suddenly realize, right, as, as I read previously, that they might have answers too, that most of what is happening to them is not accidental. It's actually constructed by the system in which they exist, right? What he's also trying to teach us towards the end of what I just read is the emotional dependence of the oppressed on the oppressor and the system and the oppressor system. I mean, think of it so much. I mean, it also happens a lot if they are part of the middle class, as we read earlier. Because so much of their life depends on the existing system, they are very reluctant to change it. Right? Think of the liberation movements or even general activism in our life right now. People who are poor, but they have learned through solidarity with others that they are being racially stereotyped, that they are being targeted. Since they have nothing to lose, it's easier to mobilize for them. But people who are somewhere in the middle class, their sympathies are already aligned with the elite, right? And they are the ones who would discourage their fellows, why are you rocking the boat? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Because they have internalized that they are on their path to becoming the dominant group. That's the problem of American politics all along, right? Other than race and everything else, that everyone lives in an elsewhere that's in the future, right? Uh, 
Now, what he's also saying is that this discovery of being exploited, it cannot just be intellectual. People can't be expected to sit and just think their way through. It has to be something that involves a praxis. It can't also be just activism, like mere activism where you just are fighting but don't know what you're fighting for. It must become a praxis, and it becomes a praxis by infusing theory, lived experience, learning from each other, and then developing a politics out of it. And that's where he's headed. Now remember, this is an educational project. But before he gives us the mode of education that he's going to explain in this book, He's telling us what this education is for. It is the pedagogy of the oppressed. But then he must define who the oppressed are. How do they become oppressed? Why do they think the way they do? Right? How not to administer knowledge to them? How to learn from them? And then how to acknowledge that the oppressed themselves will liberate themselves, but also liberate everyone else. And the only way to do it is to change the larger system within which this duality of oppressor-oppressed exists, right? But that change is not just going to happen because you, me, and everyone else wrote an essay about it or gave a lecture on it. That change is going to happen when we come together, figure out a way of eliminating the causes, right? that is the relationship of oppressor and oppressed, but also figure out a way where the oppressed learn of their own oppression and strive to change it, and in the process, change the system in which they exist. So much of what we read these days, decolonialism and decolonial thinking, is based in this mode of thinking, right? And the idea is, can we change the system if we function within it and think within its logic? or? Do we need to come up with alternative modes of thinking, alternative modes of philosophy and praxis? That's what is at stake here. But do keep in mind, in the end, pedagogy of the oppressed is a pedagogical project. But this is a revolutionary pedagogy. This is a pedagogy that attempts not just to change people's perception of the world, but their existence in the world. So that's all I have today. I will come back, of course, the next lecture. I hope to conclude chapter one in the next conversation and then do a summary of what we have discussed in a separate lecture. Now, just for you to keep in mind, I have compiled the first 10 lectures in two videos. They're pretty long, I must warn you. But instead of going chunk by chunk, you can also watch those two compiled lectures on the channel right, in two sections. And then my hope is that the last part that I'll do to conclude chapter one will be in the third section. So the entire chapter one will then be in three large, long uh, videos. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, as always, please post them in the comment section and I will try to answer them. Please also subscribe to the channel so that you get timely notifications. And on a side note, we now have a full-fledged educational website with quite a few courses that we have already developed, some free, some paid. Please do check it out. It's called Cross-Cultural Learning, and the web address is masudraja.com. Thank you so much for today, and I will see you next time. Until next time, peace and love. Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and I'm here today with yet another conversation about Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And this is my 12th conversation with you on this book. Now remember, the project of these lectures is not to just lecture you, but to read the book with you. So I strongly urge you to get any edition of the book, an online edition, and read along so that we can learn together. Now, in the previous lecture, if you watched it, I strongly urge you to do so. Um, we had left our conversation on page 65. 
right, where he's talking about the passivity and emotional dependence of the oppressed, how does it come to be, and the need for defining a praxis. Praxis for Freire depends on two things, reflection and action. Reflection on one's lived conditions, knowing why the world is the way it is on the part of the peasants, on the part of the oppressed, and then working in solidarity to change that, right? To change the world as it is. So that's where we are starting from page 65, middle of the page. I will finish the chapter today because the last page is 69. But here, let's read the next couple of paragraphs and then I'll come back to you to talk about it. Critical and liberating dialogue, which presupposes action, must be carried on with the oppressed at whatever the stage of their struggle for liberation. The content of that dialogue can and should vary in accordance with historical conditions and the level at which the oppressed perceive reality. But to substitute monologue, slogans, and communiques for a dialogue is to attempt to liberate the oppressed with the instruments of domestication. Attempting to liberate the oppressed without their reflective participation in the act of liberation is to treat them as object which, which must be saved from a burning building. It is to lead them into the populist fitfall and transform them into masses which can be manipulated. At all stages of their liberation, the oppressed must see themselves as women and men engaged in the ontological and historical vocation of becoming more fully human. Reflection and action become imperative when, does not, when one does not erroneously attempt to dichotomize the content of humanity from his, its historical forms. The insistence that the oppressed engaged in reflection on their concrete situation is not a call to armchair revolution. On the contrary, reflection, true reflection, leads to action. On the other hand, when the situation calls for action, that all action will constitute an authentic praxis only if its consequences become the object of critical reflection. In this sense, the praxis is the new raison d'etre of the oppressed and the revolution which inaugurates the historical moment of this raison d'etre is not viable apart from their con concomitant conscious involvement. Otherwise, action is pure activism. To achieve this praxis, however, it is necess necessary to trust in the oppressed and in their ability to reason. Whoever lacks this trust will fail to initiate or will abandon dialogue reflection and communication and will fall into using slogans, communiques, monologues, and instructions. Superficial conversion to the cause of liberation carry this danger. So let us think of what I just read. What we are getting from this is a distinction between uncritical populism and a real praxis of liberation. And a praxis of liberation becomes mere activism and populism when it is hijacked, first of all, by someone who claims to speak for the people. When it is top-down, like communiques and instructions, they come from top-down, where someone claims that he or she alone can solve the problems of the masses and uses the energy of the masses to achieve their end. So what Freire is forestalling here is any possibility of an attempt by the elite or any individual or a group of individual taking over the liberatory process. And one indicator of it is always when any constituency or group assumes that they have all the answers and people 
need to be liberated because then they are teaching, treating the people as things, as not having a volition of their own. True liberation, of course, according to the passages that I just read and generally what comes across in this book, is based in reflection, right? Reflection on the part of the oppressed themselves, on their lived conditions, on the injustices in the society, right? And then that is mobilized into action, right? So the reason, the raison d'etre, the reason of its being then, right? What is this? In this sense, the praxis is the new raison d'etre of the oppressed and the revolution, right? Praxis. And how does he define praxis? A combination of reflection, Within the historical context, as he says, within the situation where a particular group of the oppressed might exist, but reflection on that, but a critical reflection of understanding their own situation, understanding what is going on, but not just mere reflection, not armchair politics, right? Then mobilizing that reflection in solidarity with others into action to change things. And remember, Whenever we are talking about change in Freire, the change is geared towards realization of full humanity by the oppressed, a humanity in which they are equal with others, in which they have all their rights, right, and in which they can live as free citizens of the world, right? What else also comes across uh, is that to achieve this praxis, all constituencies have to believe that the oppressed have the mental capacities, the intellectual capacities to reason, to think about their own lived condition, and not necessarily that they are dumb and they are objects and they need to be taught or instructed. So dialogue, what he means by a dialogue is that all the constituencies even if you have joined the movement from the ranks of the oppressor class, must dialogue with the knowledge that the oppressed can think for themselves, that they should think for themselves, they should reflect, and the praxis so developed would then have the input of the oppressed in their own liberation. Right? If that's not involved, then it becomes a kind of populist politics in which demagogues, dictators, can mobilize the popular sentiment in the name of liberating the people without making any structural changes, right? And convert them into masses, right? And that's what Freire is trying to teach us should not happen because superficial con con conversion to the cause of liber liberation carries this danger, right? So if someone uncritically joins it or appropriates it, and if in the process the oppressed themselves are not reflecting and trying to change the imbalance which creates them into objects, right, then all that's happening is that one or two people or a political party or a group is appropriating the sentiment of the oppressed, converting them into this mass movement which enables them to gain power, but which doesn't necessarily change the unequal system. So we are towards the end of the first chapter now, right? We are now going into the subtleties of what is praxis, what must it not do, right? What's the role of reflection and action? What is mere activism? Mere activism is an activism that has no reflection behind it, that has no dialogue behind it, right? Between different constituencies. Because in the next chapter, you know, he will move on to then actually giving us the pedagogy of the oppressed and how must it be done. So I will read on and then I'll come back and talk about the further reading a little more. Political action on the side of the oppressed must be pedagogical action in the authentic sense of the word, and therefore action with the oppressed. Those who work for liberation must not take advantage of the emotional dependence of the oppressed, dependence that is the fruit of the 
concrete situation of domination which surrounds them and which engendered their unauthentic view of the world. Using their dependence to cre create still greater, greater dependence is an oppressor tactic. Libertarian action must recognize this dependence as a weak point and must attempt through reflection and action to transform it into independence. However, not even the best intentioned leadership can bestow independence as a gift. The liberation of the oppressed is a, a liberation of women and men, not things. Accordingly, while no one liberates himself or his own efforts alone, neither is he liberated by others. Liberation, a human phenomenon, cannot be achieved by semi-humans. Any attempt to treat people as semi-humans only dehumanizes them. When people are already dehumanized due to the oppression they suffer, the process of their liberation must not employ the methods of dehumanization. The correct method for a revolutionary leadership to employ in the task of liberation is therefore not liber libertarian propaganda, nor can the leadership merely implant in the oppressed a belief in freedom, thus thinking to win their trust. The correct method lies in dialogue the conviction of the oppressed that they must fight for their liberation is not a gift bestowed by the revolutionary leadership, but the result of their own consensiazako or consentiazaka. The revolutionary leaders must realize that their own conviction of the necessity for struggle an indispensable dimension of revolutionary wisdom was not given to them by anyone else if it is authentic. This conviction cannot be packaged and sold. It is reached rather by means of a totality of reflection and action. Only the leader's own involvement in reality within an historical situation led them to criticize this, this situation and to wish to change it. Likewise, the oppressed who do not commit themselves to the struggle unless they are convinced and who, if they do not make such a commitment, withhold the indispensable conditions for this struggle must reach this conviction as subjects, not as objects. They also must intervene critically in the situation which surrounds them and whose mark they bear. Propaganda cannot achieve this while the conviction of the necessity for struggle, without which the struggle is unfeasible, is indispensable to the revolutionary re leadership. Indeed, it was this conviction which constituted that leadership. It is also necessary for the oppressed. It is necessary, that is, unless one, in, one intends to carry out the transformation for the oppressed, rather than with them, transformation for the oppressed, rather than with them. It is my belief that only the latter form of transformation is valid. The object in presenting these considerations consideration is to defend the eminently pedagogical character of the revolution. The revolutionary leaders of every epoch who have affirmed that the oppressed must accept the struggle for their liberation, an obvious point, have also thereby implicitly recognized the pedagogical aspect of their struggle. Many of these leaders, however, perhaps due to natural and understandable biases against pedagogy, have ended up using the educational methods employed by the oppressors. They deny pedagogical action in the liberation process, but they use propaganda to convince. Okay, so we are reaching the end of chapter one, right? So in this part, he's still focusing on the difference between authentic uh, resistance and leadership and inauthentic propaganda-based what he calls libertarian ideology. So 
libertarian struggle then for him can never be authentic as long as it is driven top down and relies on propaganda where it mobilizes the people to achieve certain ends without changing the larger structures in which people exist. And important in this reading is the term consentiazaka, right, or consentiazation, coming to consciousness. Now, Freire discusses this, this at length in chapter three, but in the preface of the book, the term Consentiazaka refers to learning to perceive social, political, and economic contradictions and to take action against the oppressive elements of reality, right? So that means that it's the kind of consciousness that doesn't, is not just fact-based, but that one, it also helps people realize the historical, social, and political conditions in which one lives. Another important thing that came out from this passage, these passages that I just read, is the question of pedagogy. Now for Freire then, any revolutionary movement is a pedagogical process. And the reason it's a pedagogical process is after all because what are we trying to accomplish, as he explains? What we are trying to accomplish is first of all humanization of the very people who had been dehumanized. Then these people who now have rehumanized themselves through reflection and praxis and not through top-down teaching, right, are the ones who are going to lead the struggle to change the larger system in which they have existed, right? This cannot be done through mere propaganda where someone comes along and mobilizes the people towards change. People must reach this consciousness in solidarity with others. And when they do that by looking at their own life, by critically, revolution then becomes a pedagogical project because in the process of revolutionary change, people first become human and then claim their place in the world. Think of most revolutionary movements or even, you know, pragmatic movements. What they tell us is that let us help us change the world and once it is changed, you will have a better place in it. No, the purpose of this revolutionary pedagogy is to reconcile people, according to Freire, with their own humanity. And they cannot wait until the end of the revolution to reach there. The first step is for them to realize their equal humanity, claim it, and then launch the revolutionary change. The project is pedagogical because it, for, for the peasants, for the oppressed, it is pedagogical because they are discovering their own lived conditions and how have their selves been constructed. But then they are also teaching the leadership what they feel how do they think, right? And not simply learning top down, right? And the mistake what he's saying is most revolutionary leaders make is that in, in their attempt to train the workers, in their attempt to educate the peasants, they employ the same top down methods. They come from outside and say, here, if you do this, this is a solution to your problems. It's kind of the similar vein as the role of the organic intellectual who might have the knowledge but who go and lives with the people, learns from them and shares his or her own knowledge with them but never tries to tell the people this is how we do things and if you do it my way you will learn it. Or in case of politics it's never someone instigating the people to rise without humanizing them but only instrumentalizing them. That's a subtle difference between uncritical populism, top-down populism, propagandistic politics. Now remember, propaganda was a major part in the Soviet Bolshevik Revolution and later on as well. So there is a, an explicit critique of that kind of communism and Marxism, right? And uh, what else came through? Okay, so that's all uh, the thoughts I have about the passages I just read. And then um, we'll go and read the concluding passage 
of this chapter and I'll come back and talk to you a little more about that. For the oppressed to realize that when they accept the struggle for humanization, they also accept from that moment their total responsibility for the struggle. They must realize that they are fighting not merely for freedom from hunger, but for, and this is a quote from Eric Fromm, freedom to create and to construct, to wonder and to venture. Such freedom requires that the individual be active and responsible, not a slave or well-fed cog in the machine. It is not enough that men are not slaves. If social conditions further the existence of automations, the result will not be love of life, but love of death." End of quote. The oppressed who have been shaped by the death-affirming climate of oppression must find through their struggle the way to life-affirming humanization, which does not lie simply in having more to eat, although it does involve having more to eat and cannot fail to include this aspect. The oppressed have been destroyed precisely because their situation has re reduced them to things. In order to regain their humanity, they must cease to be things and fight as men and women. This is a radical requirement. They cannot enter the struggle as objects in order later to become human beings. The struggle begins with men's recognition that they have been destroyed. Propaganda, management, manipulation, all arms of domination cannot be the instruments of their rehumanization. The only effective instrument is a humanizing pedagogy in which the revolutionary leadership establishes a permanent relationship of dialogue with the oppressed. In a humanizing pedagogy, the method ceases to be an instrument by which the teachers, in this instance the revolutionary leadership, can manipulate the students, in this instance the oppressed because it expresses the consciousness of the students themselves. The method is, in fact, the external form of consciousness manifest in acts, which takes on the fundamental property of consciousness, its intentionality. And this is also a quote and, uh, from uh, Alvaro Vieira Pinto, and he's quoting from there, uh, the method, it's the quote starts here. The method is in fact the external form of consciousness manifests an act which takes on the fundamental property of consciousness, its intentionality. The essence of consciousness is being with the world and this behavior is permanent and unavoidable. Accordingly, consciousness is in essence a way toward something apart from itself outside of itself, which surrounds it and which it apprehends by means of its ideational capacity. Consciousness is thus by definition a method in the most general sense of the word." End of quote. A revolutionary leadership must accordingly practice co-intentional education. Teachers and students, leadership and people, co-intent on, intent on reality are both subjects, not only in the task of unveiling that reality and thereby coming to know it critically, but in the task of recreating that knowledge. As they attain this knowledge of reality through common reflection and action, they discover themselves as its permanent recreators. In this way, the presence of the oppressed in the struggle for their liber liberation will be what it should be, not pseudo-participation, but committed involvement. Okay, so with this final reading of these few passages, we have reached the end of chapter one. And what's instructive in the last part that I just read is the quote, because it is about consciousness, right? And this is a phenom phenomenological take on consciousness. Remember, in Husserl's phenomenology, thought is always outward tending, right? So reflection is never just reflection about oneself. It's never, in that Cartesian sense, you know, thinking from within, 
right? Since thought is always outward tending, right? So that means that the oppressed think when they reflect, they are thinking outwardly about the world in which they exist, right? And if those who want to work with them, those in the position of leadership, if it is a pedagogical relationship, it becomes pedagogy of the oppressed when both the teacher and the students are co-intentional, which means is they are thinking outward about the world, but they are thinking together with each other. Right? That's what being co-intentional means, right? Thought intended outwards. But also a thought in which the student is not the object of that thought. Right? So the pedagogical thought doesn't go seeking this passive student and fill it. It's a pedagogical practice in which both the teacher and the student, the leader and the so-called led, are thinking together, co-intention, intending the change that they want to come about in the world. Right. Um, what also comes clear in, in this part of the chapter is also his emphasis on humanizing pedagogy. That if pedagogy is meant to humanize people, it cannot use the strategies that were used to dehumanize people, right? So then it cannot be a pedagogy that based in the same old top-down model in which the teacher has all the knowledge and the student doesn't think a student just reproduces the knowledge offered by the teacher. And you can apply it to the political situations. It cannot then be a kind of politics in which the leadership or a cadre of leadership or a single leader are the one who have all the answers, right? And people must follow. So not only is he articulating a practical pedagogy a liberating pedagogy, but there is a lot other things that we are learning in this chapter and eventually in the book. And one of them is to rid ourselves of our microfascisms, right? What is a microfascism according to Deleuze when any one of us looks around and hopes, oh, I wish we had better leaders. I wish someone would lead us out of it. That's a microfascism that we all have internalized, right? Instead of thinking that we can be the catalyst for change and that we can come up with things ourselves looking outwards and then finding more people in our own lived conditions in solidarity in, and then bring it to the world and change it. Why do we keep thinking that someone needs to come and liberate us? That is the dehumanization at work. Right. So by the end of the chapter then, and let me read the last few sentences, a revolutionary leadership must accordingly practice co-intentional education. Teachers and students co-intent on reality are both subjects, not only in the task of unveiling that reality and thereby coming to know it critically, but in the task of recreating that knowledge. So co-intention. So the teachers and students are doing two things. They are together thinking the world in which they exist critically. That's reflection, right? Reflection based in knowing the world around it, how it works, what are its injustices, and then praxis, attempting to change it. So by the end of the chapter, we have learned what the project of education is to humanize the oppressed, the process of how we would get there, and that it's a pedagogical practice, and the pedagogy must be co-intentional in which the students are not passives and teachers are not givers of all the knowledge. So that's where my reading of chapter one ends. Now, what do you think it teaches us about our current world and current situation? You know, do you have any opinions about it? I would love to hear your opinions in the comments about what we have covered in these 12 lectures. Now, I'm not done with chapter one. I will now, after this reading part, of chapter one, 
record a brief lecture which would give you a summary of chapter one. What are the major things that we learned, that we discussed, and then after that, we will move on to chapter two. I hope this has been a useful experience to me. It has been wonderful, certainly for me, to reread Freire and rethink my own practices. Um, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. It helps me because more of you can come and interact with me, but also it will keep you informed as to what is coming next. And also, if you're interested in learning these things in a more formalistic setting, we now have a full website, Cross-Cultural Learning, where we are developing different courses in humanities. Please do check it out. The website address is masudraja.com. That's all I have to say in this. Thank you so much for your time and for joining me. And I am really deeply grateful to you all uh, because you all keep me going, keep me motivated, and thank you for that. With that, thank you. I'll be back next time, and until then, peace and love. Hello, and welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and in this brief video, I will give you a sort of a conclusion and a summary of chapter one of Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Now, those of you who follow my channel probably already know that I have a series of 12 lectures in which I did the line-to-line -line reading of chapter one. And so you can always go in detail by watching those videos. But I thought I should also provide a, a summary of what Freire is setting up in chapter one. So if you look at the very beginning of the chapter, he explains the world in this dichotomous relationship, in this agonistic relationship. <clears throat> there is a group of oppressors and there is a group of oppressed. That relationship, according to him, is a relationship of dominance, right? In which the oppressor group <clears throat> attempts and tries to create the oppressed as these silent, dehumanized subjects or objects you could say. So the struggle then is for the oppressed to reclaim their full humanity, right? That is the object of any pedagogy, but especially a pedagogy of the oppressed. How to claim their full humanity, right, for the oppressed. Now, please keep in mind that Freire's idea of human subjectivity is pretty romantic there is a certain romantic humanism involved over here, which was part of, uh, you know, early Marx as well. And that he's very Marxist in his approach, or socialistic, you could say that. Now, after establishing that the world exists in this dichotomous order in which the oppressed are caught in this duality, where their actions and even their consciousness is governed by, governed by the system created by the oppressors, the purpose of pedagogy of the oppressed then is to develop a kind of pedagogy with the oppressed that enables them to claim their full humanity. But since they have been dehumanized by a dehumanizing system perpetuated by the oppressors, one other aspect of liberation then is for the oppressed to not just liberate themselves, but also in the process humanize their oppressors, who after all, by dehumanizing others, have also dehumanized themselves. So that's the project. Then in the chapter he also discusses, you know, how do the oppressed internalize the logic of oppression. Since they only have existed in an oppressive environment, that's the only system that they know. So even when they think of their own liberation, their first model is to emulate their masters, right? So the pedagogy of the oppressed then must also take into account that the oppressed, in defining their own humanity, realize that they can't define it on the model of their oppressors, right? They can't, when they are successful, become the oppressors themselves, right? And that's another aspect of pedagogy of the oppressed that Freire is trying to highlight. Then he goes on to describe that, okay, when 
the fight for liberation of the oppressed is launched by the oppressed themselves, right? How do they get there? Through praxis, right? What is praxis? Praxis is a combination of reflection and action. Reflection not just on their own selves, but also on the world in which they live, right? And when they reflect upon it and then act to change it, that is what becomes a praxis. Now, when that happens, when that liberatory movement is launched by the oppressed, he also then theorizes what to do with people who might leave the order of the oppressed and join the ranks of uh, order of the oppressors and join the ranks of the oppressed, right? And so the idea is that they should be welcomed in solidarity, but those who have left the house of the oppressor to join the oppressed must keep in mind that they cannot come in with their own consciousness, which is formulated in the model of the oppressor and try to tell the oppressed this is how we do things. So there is no top down, but there is room in a liberatory movement led by the oppressed to accept people in solidarity, people who previously might have been part of the oppressive order themselves. Then in this chapter, he also discusses the nature of oppressed consciousness. Because it's constructed by an oppressive structure and by the oppressors, Sometimes, and he is coming through Fanon, the oppressed turn on each other, right? Because their situation is precarious and because they don't know anything outside of the system in which they exist, and since the public sphere is owned by the colonizers and the oppressors, right, the only violence that they can practice turns on their own communities where they fight each other. They practice it on their families, their children, right? Realizing that then enables them that part of what they are doing is caused by the trauma of living in a colonial situation, living in an oppressive environment. Then towards the middle of the chapter, he further theorizes, uh, you know, the revolutionary movement itself, how will it come about, right? How would the peasants and workers come to consciousness of their own lived condition. One thing that any liberatory movement, according to Freire, must avoid is the hijacking of the people's movement, people's liberation struggle by an elite through propaganda, right? Through sloganeering, through communiques, instructions. Because then what is happening is people are still objectified. They are tools in the hands of a demagogue or a group of people who claim to liberate them, but they're only using people as chess pieces to play their own games, right? So a true liberatory movement will make sure that no one appropriates people still as objects to achieve their own ends. Any leader who does that according to Freire, is not administering, doing authentic praxis. Right? And then towards the end of the chapter, he basically teaches us that all liberatory movements, revolutions, right, they are pedagogical in nature. They are pedagogic, pedagogical in nature because in the process of liberating ourselves, we must first learn our lived conditions, right? Those must be taught, but not taught from top. If I am a teacher and I want to teach liberatory way of life towards freedom and full humanity, I cannot bring it in a basket to my classroom and distribute it. Liberation and freedom is never given, right? So how must we go about it? We must go about it by thinking together, right? And any recipe for change that is done for the poor, for the oppressed, is not going to change that. In order for change to happen, it must be done with the oppressed. In this chapter also, there is a very important concept 
two or three very important concepts, but first is of false generosity that he talks about. What is false generosity? False charity or false generosity, according to Freire, is any attempts by the elite or by a group that has resources to just throw money at things or try to cosmetically change things, right? We're going to give you our extra clothes. We're going to give you some charity without changing the structures that produce poverty, that produce inequality. That, according to Freire, is false generosity, right? And we can see that in the world aid programs, aid sent by the developing countries to, you know, by the developed countries to developing countries, and they feel good about it, but they are not doing anything to change the global inequalities that they themselves have pr produced. So that is false generosity. Ngugi uh, Cheongo has a beautiful passage in The Devil on the Cross where he talks about that kind of false generosity where these people bring charity to us during the day and rob us at night. That's what he says. So that's another concept that he's theorizing in this chapter. But over and all, what he is laying grounds for in this chapter is the need for pedagogy of the oppressed, but emphasizing that it cannot be top down, that the oppressed are capable of thought and thinking and reasoning, and they know their conditions and can learn more, right? And if we or anyone else wants to work with them, we must work with their experience, right? We must think with them, and that's why towards the end he talks about inten inten intention and in intentionality of consciousness, because it always tends outwards, right? And that teacher and student must do that together, right? So overall, the other concept, major concept that he touches upon is conscientiousako, right? I, I'm probably pr pr pronouncing it wrong, which is coming to con consciousness, but the kind of thinking which doesn't only think the self, but also thinks the world, the politics, the ec economics of one's existence. And that is what the oppressed must come to, must think the way their life and living in it in order to change the world. And so towards the end of the chapter, then he is going towards revolutionary change, right? Change in societies and elsewhere, and what he calls it, that revolutionary act itself is a pedagogical practice. It is a pedagogical practice because people must co-learn with others their own lived experiences, right? And after they have done that, they must work together to change it. The whole project, romantic as it sounds, is for the oppressed who have been dehumanized through an oppressive system by the figure of the oppressor to claim their full humanity, to be free, independent human beings in the world. Now, another thing that he points out is that this cannot just be done. We can't promise the people that after the revolution is done, they will gain all their rights and they will be able to become fully realized humans. No. People must first claim their humanity and then bring about change. There is also a cautionary note towards the end of the chapter about appropriation of the potential of the people by demagogues, by groups and constituencies who appropriate for populist reasons the sentiment of the people and their poverty and mobilize them to their own ends without changing anything. And that kind of leadership for Freire is also unauthentic, right? And the oppressed also must learn to do, to deal with it. But also anyone who wants to take a position of leadership in any liberatory movement needs to keep that in mind, right? And so then towards the end of the chapter, what we are learning is that revolutionary change is a pedagogical practice. It involves a praxis. A praxis is always a combination of reflection and action, but reflection not just about one's own self, but one's existence in the world outside as it impacts my life and everyone else's life. And when these come together, and when teacher and student 
co-intend and co-think the change, then develops a kind of pedagogy which is pedagogy of the oppressed and not for the oppressed, not top-down, but practiced and delivered, right, with the participation and full humanity of the oppressed themselves. So these are some of the thoughts, of course, uh, that are covered in chapter one. Now, of course, if you have time and energy, you can go through all the 12 lectures that I have recorded. I, I'm calling them lectures, but they are mostly conversations where we read chapter one word to word and talked about it. I highly recommend that. I will post uh, the links to that on the end screen. And meanwhile, what do you think of chapter one? Do you think it actually applies to our life as students, workers uh, of the 21st century, as professors of 21st century? If it does, please, you know, post your comments in the comment section so that we can have a conversation. And if you have not already um, subscribed to the channel, please do so. Uh, and, you know, post any questions that you might have. Uh, with this, I will sign off. Thank you so much for being a part of this wonderful experience. And now I will see you next time. Until then, as always, peace and love.